So we're currently at the Co Science of Consciousness conference in Tucson, Arizona. And today's guest on the podcast is none other than Stuart Kaufman, <laughs> who is a medical doctor and a theoretical biologist. And he was also the editor of the Theoretical Biology Journal some time ago and has many ideas on the nature of consciousness and the origi origins of life. Um, would you like to perhaps add to that summary? About me? Yeah. Uh, I'm getting to be an old man. <laughs> I'm 78. That counts. I used to be able to ski well and I just went up skiing with my son and I've become an intermediate. But I've skied all over Europe and all over the United States. It's disturbing getting to be 78. You, you find that your body doesn't do what it did at 48 the same way. You'll find out, Josh, one day if you make it. If I make it. <laughs> right. Touch wood. I think I could ski well again, but I have to go up and get my ski legs under me. So, uh, you've been coming to this conference for several years now. Yeah. Uh, do you think we'll ever crack the mystery of consciousness with science? I think we have a, a, a modest chance. How is that for... I don't think it's zero. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that it's extremely likely, but I think that it's possible. Um, one of the issues here is, will, do, will we know what consciousness is? Okay, in the, in the big sense of capital I-S. Um, I don't see how to crack that. Uh, and I, I am a reluctant panpsychist. Mm -hmm. That is a, uh, well, I, do you want to know what I actually think? Yeah. You're in danger of my telling you. So if you want to ask me about consciousness, I'll be glad so to tell you what I think. So you're actually a panpsychist? Reluctant. Reluctant. No, no, not reluctant. That's the wrong word. Skeptical. I'm a skeptical panpsychist. So you think consciousness preceded biological life? Skeptically, yes. Okay. <laughs> Nobody knows, so, so I could be anything other than skeptical, right? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, would it be safe to say that there were some incidences during your life which, which put you on that pathway? Well, yeah, I have, um, I've been thinking about, when I was young, I, I, I told you I went to Dartmouth and I went to Oxford, and I, I did philosophy, psychology, and physiology at Oxford, and climbed over the wall of Magdalen College, because they still closed the gates of the college at that time, and I, I did philosophy of mind in part, and I've been fascinated by the philosophy of mind since I was a young man. Um, then I put it down for years and did other things. Um, but I found out about a phenomenon called decoherence about 10 years ago. And um, in a word, a quantum system has the property that it could be quantum coherent, in which case it's quantum. Um, but there's a phenomenon called decoherence in which the quantum aspects of the behavior of the system gradually fade away and it becomes quasi-classical. It's not quite classical, it's a bit technical. Um, but it's quasi-classical. Um, and what struck me about it was that this process of decoherence is, is not causal. It's a-causal. And I got very excited about that, and I came up with the idea of recoherence, because what I thought was, so, so to tell you what I thought, I have to go back uh, uh, to Descartes. So you know Descartes, Ray's cogitan raise extensive. So Descartes gave us a dualism of, of thinking stuff, stuff, the substance uh, stuff, uh, and raise extension, which is the mechanical worldview of, of extended stuff. And it's been unclear since Descartes, how in the world can mind, raise cogitan, act on, act causally on, raise extension? And the problem is it can't. And the reason is, uh, we're thinking classical physics in Newton. The problem is what's called the causal closure of classical physics. You've got all the causes in classical physics. So, roughly speaking, there's nothing for mind to do and no way for mind to do it. And we've been stuck here 
since Newton, well, since Newton, since Newton took Descartes' race extension and made classical mechanics out of it. Well, there's no answer within classical physics. But when I found out about decoherence being a-causal and giving rise to sort of an almost classical world, okay, I thought, this is fantastic. There's a way for a quantum mind to have a-causal consequences for the classical meat of the brain. Okay, you, you see the idea. I thought, well, that, that's really neat. I'd like it to do it more than once. So I just wholeheartedly and all by myself invented the idea of recoherence so it could do it many times. And this is maybe eight or 10 years ago. It turns out I was right about recoherence. It actually happens. Uh, there's a theorem due to a man named Peter Shore that's used in, in computer, uh, in quantum programming to try to get recoherence in decoherent qubits. So I was right. The problem is, is that decoherence doesn't get you exactly to the classical world. It gets you a smidge away um, in a way that's a little too technical to explain and I only partially understand it. But there's something fundamental in quantum mechanics called measurement. So you have, uh, you, you, you and your audience will know the two-slit experiment. So you take uh, 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 a piece of metal with two little slits in it and you shine a flashlight on it and on the far side of it, you put a film emulsion. And here's what happens. If you cover one of the slits, what you get is a bright spot on the film emulsion behind the open slit. If you swap which slit is open, you get a bright spot behind the other slit. If you open both slits, and then you develop the film after the photons have gone through it, you get a light, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light. Diffraction light, pattern. Which is it's called an interference pattern. Yeah, it's, it's almost a diffraction pattern. Um, so you can't explain that classically. If you imagine bullets going through the slits, you wouldn't, yeah, get, yeah. you wouldn't get this thing. Mm -hmm. You can't. So quantum mechanics imagines a wave called the Schrodinger wave equation. And this wave is propagating. And if you think of, uh, I can give you the analogy uh, pretty, pretty quickly. Imagine a seawall with two slits in it, two slot, slots. And imagine a bunch of waves propagating uh, parallel to the wall, towards the wall, through the slots and towards the beach. Well, on the beach side of the slots in the wall, you're gonna get concentric waves spreading towards the beach, right? Hemi, hemi, semicircles, yeah. correct? And you'll get a, a train of them if you've got a train of waves coming. Now walk along the beach after the waves hit the beach. There's gonna be some spots where the peak of one wave from the left slot hits the peak of another wave from the right slot, right? So you have a higher wave. That's where you get a bright spot. Some places where the trough of one wave hits the trough of the other wave, and you'll get a low spot where you also get a bright spot. But you're going to get some spots in between where the trough of one hits the peak of the other, and they'll just cancel. Yeah. That's where it's dark. Okay. So a wave equation can give you this bizarre phenomenon. Okay. And the Schrodinger equation is a Schrodinger linear wave equation that gives you all this phenomenon. So uh, von Neumann, uh, a famous mathematician who gave us the computer and a bunch of other things um, after Turing, did an interpretation of quantum mechanics in about 1933 or 1935, in which he has two processes, Josh. One is process one, and one is process two. Process two is the deterministic propagation of the Schrodinger wave equation. It just propagates it's like water waves, except that Nobody knows what's waving, okay? Uh, that's, that's another part of the story. Then process one is this magical thing when a photon goes through the slits and it hits the screen, it makes a spot, right? That spot is called quantum measurement. And to tune your amazement, if you turn down the photon gun, the flashlight, so that one photon per hour comes towards the slit, you still get the same interference pattern if you accumulate the spots. So whatever is going on, it's true of a single photon. Isn't that uh, odd, yes? So there's something where this is this funny wave that's going along, and then suddenly, wham, you've got a spot. So that's the measurement event. Nobody knows how measurement happens, okay? So I'm going to jump, and I'm going to tell you a theorem. It's called the strong free will theorem. Is this one of your own? No, it's by two famous mathematicians, Conway and Cochin. Conway gave you the game of life, okay. Okay, which you know about. So the Conway-Cochin free will theorem says uh, what are called two entangled 
uh, say electrons or say two entangled electrons. Entangled means something important. It means that um, the two electrons are not two separate electrons. They're really one system. You cannot write the wave equation for two separate particles. I only partially understand this, but entanglement... They're connected um, regardless of their space and time orientation. Yeah, this is non-locality. Yeah. You're, you're right, okay. Um, the strong free will theorem says um, nothing in the past of the universe determines the outcome of measuring, say, the second electron. Nothing in the past does. Okay. Two, there is no mechanism for measurement. That means that however measurement happens, it is not causal. It's not causal. This is astonishing. Mm -hmm. And third, uh, the electron decides non-randomly. What? <laughs> it's the only theorem I know that uses a term like decides, let alone non-randomly. Yeah. So now what I'm going to try to say is, you can ask whether or not there's a place in physics into which our ideas about consciousness comfortably fit without asking what consciousness is. I don't know what consciousness is. I think quantum measurement fulfills all those needs. So let me try to show it to you. Um, so here we, have, here we have classical physics where there's no way for mind to act on matter, causally. But suppose we either appeal to decoherence and recoherence or to quantum measurement, which is not causal. But the spot on the silver halide screen stays there for years, right? It's a developed film emulsion. Yep. So somehow that's the classical world, even though the physicists can't tell you how to get to the classical world. So a measurement event can give you something classical and can alter the classical world. Mm -hmm. It can, that's just true, despite all of the puzzles. And has it been observed in, in particles larger than fundamental particles? Yes. You mean measurement? Yes. Yeah, yeah it has. What size of particle are we talking about? People have gotten interference patterns with, uh, with buckyballs, which are 60 carbon mm -hmm. molecules. Yeah. Um, so the interference pattern presumably is a bunch of measurement events of buckyball detectors. And I don't know the details. A guy named Anton Zeilinger did that, I think. Okay, so just follow the logic. If mind is partly quantum, then via either decoherence and to do it repeatedly recoherence or via quantum measurement, both of which are not causal, quantum mind can have consequences for the classical world, therefore the classical brain. We've just answered Descartes 350 years later. I'm satisfied with that answer, Josh. Mind you, I don't know what consciousness is, but I'm satisfied with the answer that, 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 that it works, that it fits there. Okay, the next is free will. Okay, so this is, this is mind being able to act on, on classical matter. Okay. So I think that, I think the strong free will theorem suggests free will. And let me try to show you how. Suppose the world is deterministic, okay? And you have the billiard balls on Newton's billiard table. It might, might as well be Newton's billiard table. Then his equations are entirely deterministic. You write down his differential equations. The billiard balls propagate deterministically and bounce off the walls deterministically. And you integrate his equations and you get the trajectories of the balls. The trajectories are unique. Since they are unique, nothing can decide anything. It's utterly unique. It's deterministic. So you cannot have a decision, right? And of course, everybody knows this. Okay. There's a second reason that the determinism of Newton rules out decisions. So here it is. We're sitting here talking. Um, and I have free will, let us say. Well, I could get up and walk away from you right now, or I could sit here and continue talking to you. And in that case, a minute from now, the world would be different. In one case, I'm sitting here. In the other case, I'm across back into the building, right? So for, for decisions to be possible, it must be the case that the future can be different. And that's called counterfactually different because I am sitting here. I'm not in the other room, but we both think I could have been, right? Because I have free will and I could have made that decision. Well, quantum mechanics demands that on some interpretations of quantum mechanics. So there's about 10 interpretations of quantum mechanics. Only 10. 
Maybe there's 30, I don't know, there's a bunch. On some of them, measurement doesn't even happen. On others, it happens, but it's entirely deterministic. The latter is Bohm. The former is multiple worlds, okay? But there are some interpretations, including Copenhagen and including von Neumann, where measurement is real and the outcomes of measurement is ontologically indeterminate. It's ontologically indeterminate. It's not epistemological uncertainty, like flipping a coin, a classical coin, and you don't know what the wind's going to do. It's just ontologically indeterminate whether the, the electron will be measured spin up or spin down. Okay? But that means that not only is it not causal, but the present or the future can be different. It could have been measured spin up, but counterfactually it could have been measured spin down, right? So the first requirement for free will is met. The present can have been different or the future can be different. So we've met one requirement for free will. But another requirement for free will is also met by the strong free will theorem. There's no mechanism for measurement. If there were a mechanism for measurement, it couldn't be free, because there's a mechanism. If there's no mechanism for measurement, it can't be anything other than free. Okay? Okay. So we've now met the main requirements for free will. And the last one we need is that the choice can get made non-randomly. Well, in measurement, um, what are propagating with these waves, the waves are called amplitudes, and more than one can be propagating simultaneously. And what happens at measurement is you square each amplitude mathematically, and that's the probability that upon measurement, that amplitude will be the one that's measured for an amplitude to be up and an amplitude to be down, for okay. example. Yeah. And it might be 60, 40, mm -hmm. okay? Well, what happens at measurement, by God, is that one of those is the result of measurement. In a deep sense, a choice is made by the system. It will be up or it will be down. Now, one's imposing the word choice. But the strong free will, free will theorem is almost they're saying it decides, the electron decides, and it says non-randomly. So we're there, but I'm going to go one step more. That seems to meet the requirements for free will, okay? The present or the future can be different, one. Two, there's no mechanism, so the choice can be free, and it really happens. It's just not boobity bop. Measurement really, really happens. There's really a spot on the screen. So measurement really happens. If measurement's real and ontologically indeterminate, it really happens. And a choice is made among the amplitudes. And it, it really is. The last part is, and the electron decides non-randomly. Well, assume the theorem's okay. Then, then here's the puzzle. It's something called the Born rule. When you square the amplitudes of the, of the different possibilities, that's the probability that that amplitude will be the one measure. That's the Born rule. Amplitude squared is the Born rule. Well, so take a thousand electrons and they're all been prepared to be 60% probable up and 40% probable down. And you measure them and about 60% of them are up and around 40% of them are down. And if you do it lots of times, you'll get a Gaussian distribution. How can that possibly be true if A, there's no mechanism and if they decide non-randomly? This is the stre most stretchy part of what I'll say. Well, one possibility is preference. Maybe electrons have a preference to be measured 60% up and 40% down. Of course I don't know that. But given the strong free will theorem and the rest of what I've told you, the measurement event seems to be the place where consciousness, where mind can become part of the world, okay? And I actually believe what I've said. So I think that it is plausible to consider that that mind is associated with quantum measurement. And in part two of this disquisition, I'll tell you how to test it. You want to hear how to test it? Sure. Okay. Um, everybody in this conference is talking about the neural correlates of consciousness. Yeah. Well, fine. Why not? Okay. Do you think there are neural correlates of consciousness? Yeah, probably. Pr Based probably. On a quantum model like Orkawa? demonstrated by Roger Penrose and Stuart Hameroff? Well, listen, I don't really want to talk a lot about that, but, but I mean, for example, one thinks that the neurons in your cerebellum have nothing to do with consciousness, and yeah. maybe in your frontal cortex they do. Mm -hmm. Can we probably find out? Yeah, we can probably find you out. Do you think it is localized to the brain? Uh, no. But the whole a, body, maybe? Yeah, maybe. 
I mean, I, I think E. coli is perfectly plausibly conscious. Of course we don't know, okay? Just me being a, a reluctant panpsychist. So, um, so here's the experiment. Uh, I want to find the molecular, not the neural, the molecular correlates of consciousness. So here's one way to try to do that. Fruit flies, Drosophila, can be anesthetized with ether. Yeah. Take a bunch of wild type flies, just a population of flies, and if you put them under a certain dose of ether for about a half a minute, they, they go to sleep. Select a subpopulation that can be anesthetized with ever lower doses for ever shorter durations. And something like 10 generations later or 15 generations later, you'll have a population of flies that can be anesthetized with no or very little ether for a very short duration, okay? Call that the mutant population, all right? So you've selected out some genes in what we're calling the mutant population that renders them incredibly sensitive to ether. Well, let's say that they're unconscious when they're anesthetized. So the mutant population is less conscious than the wild type population, right? Well, great, all we gotta do is find the molecules involved, but that is straightforward genetics. We sequence the genome of the wild type flies, we sequence the genome of the mutant population, I'll call it the selected population, not mutant population. We find out if there's any genes that are different in the two populations. Uh, those genes might code for proteins, they might code for RNA. Say it's proteins for concreteness. Where are those proteins located in the fly? They might be Stuart Hamroff's microtubules. They might be in synaptic junctions. They might be in the wings of the fly. We don't know. Just go do it and find out. Caveat, you might be selecting in this experiment for uh, proteins that bind ether, and you have selected proteins that bind ether much better than normal. And you have to rule those out, okay, because that's just hypersensitivity to the... Right, so you've got to rule that out. There are other things that people will think of. Well, now we found some molecular correlates of consciousness. There might be one, there might be many. That's neat, just stop, full stop there. That says nothing about what those molecules do to mediate consciousness so far. Suppose though there's some quantum behaviors of the wild type molecule that are different in the mutant molecules. We might wonder whether those quantum behaviors, which might include quantum measurement, have anything to do with consciousness. So there's a way to ask that. And the way to ask it is, I need to tell you what a second sight revertant is. You can take mutants in enzymes that no longer catalyze a reaction. So it's some enzyme. And you can put a mutation in, substitute amino acid A for amino acid B, somewhere else in the protein, and it can restore enzymatic activity. They're called second sight mutants and second sight restoration. Okay, take our protein that doesn't do some quantum behavior, like a quantum measurement, find a second sight revertant mutant that now does that quantum behavior, okay, by making all possible one and two mutant variants of the original proteins, of which there's, you know, 19 times n of n is the length of the protein. It's not that many, a few thousand. So just do it. Put that mutant, that, that, that second sight revertant protein back into the selected population of flies and ask, have I restored sensitivity to ether, and therefore presumably consciousness? Well, those are doable experiments, Josh. So if we found that, we'd at least be pretty interested. And therefore we might find that there's quantum behaviors of molecules that seem to have something to do with consciousness, and it might be associated with quantum measurement. Okay, per, who knows, it might be. Right? So I, I, I think that I've sketched an experimental avenue that it isn't even that hard this, this is something that somebody could do in a year and a half in a, in a good lab. So I don't think it's impossible, just nobody's thinking it. Okay. So that's that. Um, maybe we can move on to the origins of life. Sure, let's just so knock that's off the... one of the major focal points of your, your yeah. research. Yeah. Uh, I kind of romanticized the, the concept of life coming from outer space. Um, there's a guy in Sheffield University, a professor, Milton mm. Wainwright, who yeah. found, he put balloons into the stratosphere and collected samples and yeah. found metallic hollow spheres that were microscopic that contained like bio ooze that contained... Contained what? Bio ooze, like... Bio the, ooze, the oh good. Uh, ...building blocks required uh -huh. for life. Really? Um, yeah, amino acids and, and lipids. And, and where do these things come from? 
the stratosphere. Really? Small, hollow, metallic spheres. That's amazing. Uh, microscopic ones, and that was his, him pointing out, like, you know, the uh, who knows where of panspermia. Right, so it might be panspermic. Um, and it might be. Yeah. We don't know. Now, Bruce Damar, he gave a talk yesterday. Yes, I know. So. You've been collaborating with him, I believe, yes. on certain origin of life, uh, an origin of life theory based on this planet. Yes. Um, uh, perhaps you can elaborate on that. Sure. Um, so, it's, a, it's kind of a sweet story. I guess I was about, how old are you? 33. Yeah, I was your age. No, I was a little younger than you. I was 31. Uh, and I was thinking, how did life start? Um, and the standard view at the time, and still the standard view, is you know that DNA template replicates, right? Yeah. Okay, and I assume your audience knows that DNA template. It's a double helix, as you all know. You all know. And the, the two latter sides open up, and a, an enzyme called a polymerase comes down, and it copies the nucleotide by nucleotide on one of the strands, and nucleotide by nucleotide on the other. So it's template replicating. The standard view at the time, and still the dominant view, is that life depends upon template replicating molecules like either DNA or RNA. RNA is a cousin of DNA, and it can form a double helix. And Leslie Orgel was starting his marvelous experiments trying to make it happen experimentally, okay? And I went through a very strange thought process in that strange. I thought, you know, there's the constants of nature, right? The, there's 23 constants of nature the physicists tell us. 23? Yeah. Is that the standard model of particle physics and yeah. the four fundamental forces? That's do you think it. that model is, do you think those models are complete or we need to find more forces and more particles in order to understand consciousness? Do I get to defend myself and say I'm not a physicist? <laughs> I don't know. I'll assume it's complete. Okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, it works pretty well. Anyway, there's these constants of nature, and one of the puzzles is the exact values of these constants of nature have to be pretty much what they are to get a complex universe. And one of the questions is, so why are they tuned like that? And that's led to something called the anthropic principle, namely, um, there's lots and lots of universes, and they have random values of the constants, and we're lucky we're in the ones where we could get life so that physicists could worry about why the constants of nature have the value. That's the anthropic principle. I think it's a terrible answer to a, a neat question, but that's a separate issue. What I wondered when I was your age is, what if the constants of nature were kind of different and we could still get chemistry in our universe, yeah. but we couldn't, get, we couldn't get DNA and we couldn't get RNA, so we couldn't get template replication, would life be impossible? And it just struck me that that was obscene. So what I thought was, what do you need for life? Well, you, it's, it's sort of obvious. You need a bunch of molecules that can undergo chemical reactions. And then you better have some catalysts around that can speed up chemical reactions. And then it was just obvious to me, you better have a bunch of molecules having the property that each molecule can catalyze the formation of some other of the molecules in a set of molecules that mutually catalyze one another's formation. Okay, so I catalyze your formation out of out of Josh parts and you catalyze my formation yeah. out of Stu parts. Catalyze my formation out of uh, Josh, Josh parts. parts and... uh, you catalyze my formation out of Stu parts. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, so we mutually catalyze one another. Or catalysis means spitting up a chemical reaction. You don't shift the equilibrium of a reaction, Josh, when you catalyze it. You just increase the speed of approaching equilibrium. So, okay. Um, which is a technical detail that doesn't matter. Right? You speed up the reaction. So if you had a bunch of molecules that mutually catalyze one another's formation, it seemed to me that, that'd be pretty good, right? Yeah. So the idea, I call that a collectively autocatalytic set. Okay, this is 1971. So I made a model. So are we talking about globular proteins here? Sure. Okay. That'll do. Yeah. Proteins. Yeah. Or RNA. Yeah. I've always liked proteins better, but it could, be, it could be anything. Actually, it could be an economy. It turns out that the idea is very general. What about something that works on the basic principles of like a prion protein? That, um, that, that folds in a funny way. Yeah, and then through interaction with another similar protein, alters its configuration. Yeah, we need more than altering configuration. Okay. I, 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 gotta, I gotta actually build you out of parts of you, mm -hmm. not just change the way you're folded, right? It won't, it, that, that, that could be another part of it, but I better make you and you better make me.
Right. Can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So uh, here's the model. I modeled a protein as a linear string of ones and zeros, like one, 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 zero, zero, one. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if I have a maximum length string, length 10, then there's a, a, a finite number of kinds of molecules in the system. It's, it turns out it's two to the n, two to the 10 plus one or two to the 11th. Because there's all the one mers, two mers, three mers, four mers, five mers. But if I make it 20, there's more. There's up to 21 million or something, 22 million kinds of molecules. So I'm going to tune the maximum length of a molecule in this model. Then I'm going to allow two kinds of reactions. Two strings can glue together. So one, one, one can join to zero, zero, zero to make one, 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 zero, zero, zero. And a molecule can break apart. So one, 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 zero, zero, zero can, can break apart to make one, 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 zero and zero, zero. Yeah. Okay, got it? Yeah. Okay. Write down a drawing in which you've got all possible reactions and all possible molecules. It's called a bipartite graph in which there are dots that represent reactions and circles that represent molecules. You write down the name of each molecule in each circle and, and, and you have little lines coming to them saying who makes whom, okay? Like one, one, one and zero, zero, zero get together to make one, 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 zero, zero, zero. That's called a bipartite reaction graph. It's bipartite because there's two kinds of nodes, dots and circles, and every dot has lines coming in from circles and vice versa. So that's a fancy name, but that's all it means. Then I, I, I said, if only I knew which molecule catalyzed which reaction, I could know whether or not there's a collectively autocatalytic set here. I said, but I have no idea what molecule catalyzes which reaction. So I'm gonna make a really stupid, simple model. I'm gonna assume every molecule has the same probability P, one in a million, say, of catalyzing each reaction. So I'm going to assign my catalysts at random. I'll pick up molecule one and I'll take reaction one. I said, do you catalyze this reaction, one in a million? Well, no, but it turns out you catalyze reaction 17. Draw a dotted line from that molecule to that reaction and do it for all the molecules. So you get a bunch of, you get this graph with a bunch of dotted lines. And now you can ask, is there a collectively autocatalytic set in there? Right, you, you see the idea. The answer is, is yes, there is. So let me tune your in intuition as to why. Um, so in, were you at my talk? Huh? Yeah. Okay, so um, this is work done by Erdős and Renier in 1959 and 60. Take a bunch of buttons, and I told you about a red spool of thread. Put the buttons on the floor. Pick up a random pair of buttons, break off a piece of thread, and tie the buttons together and put them back down. Just keep doing that. Keep picking random pairs of buttons. And every now and then lift up a button and ask how many buttons do I lift with it? Well, at first, the pairs of buttons that are tied together are disconnected. But as you tie more and more buttons together, they start to become interconnected. And it's a theorem that when the ratio of threads to buttons is a half, the number of ends of threads, which is two, is equal to the number of buttons, yeah. and all of a sudden, most of the things all get connected to one another. Yeah. It's called the giant component in a random graph, okay? So the intuition is, is when you connect enough things together, all of a sudden everything gets connected. That happens in this model, and the reason is about three sentences away. Um, as the length of the longest polymer n goes up, like from 10 to 20, the number of polymers in the system is going up exponentially, right? Because it's two to the n. But Josh, the number of reactions is going up even faster. There's more reactions than there are polymers. And you can see that because a big molecule can be made out of littler pieces. You can break it, if it's length n, you can make it by breaking it in n minus one ways, all of its internal bonds. So that's n minus one ways you can make this big guy, right? So there's more and more reactions per polymer in this model. At some point, you've got to catalyze so many goddamn reactions that they'll all go connected. Can you see the intuition? And that's exactly what it is. It's a theorem, and it's been simulated many, many, many times. So what happens is, as a phase transition, you get the sudden emergence of a collectively autocatalytic set. And I've been in love with that since I was 31. And I still think it's the most plausible way to get molecular reproduction. Okay? And so that's part of what I talked about whenever it was yesterday. So, um, so there's two major views on the origin of life. One's template replicating RNA. 
where what people are trying to do is evolve an RNA molecule that can be a, an enzyme that copies itself. That might work. It hasn't worked, but it might work. And I don't want to rule that out. That would be foolish. And God bless them. I mean, they're working really hard, and that, and that might go. On the autocatalytic set front, they've been made. So the most important to tell you right now is Gonan Ashkenazi has a nine peptide. Peptides are small proteins. It's a nine peptide collectively autocatalytic set in Israel and Ben Gurion. And peptide one catalyzes the formation of peptide two, which catalyzes the formation of peptide three, and then nine catalyzes the formation of peptide one. But it's made out of proteins. So it's a fact that you do not need template replicating RNA to get molecular reproduction. That claim is wrong. That doesn't mean that's how life started, but that claim is just wrong. There's also autocatalytic sets of RNA, and a guy named Niles Lehman has taken um, what are called ribozymes, which are evolved RNA molecules. Um, he's taken, I think, 15 of them, and each one has a catalytic site and a recognition site. And he's cleaved the two apart, so he's got halved ribozymes, and he stuck them in a pot with some magnesium for some reason, and they have the catalytic site from one can sort of glue itself to the recognition site of another to make a functioning ribozyme. And he asked, do I get any autocatalytic sets? And the answer is he does spontaneously. He gets an autocatalytic set of one guy, then three guys, then five guys, then seven guys. So we have the spontaneous formation of collectively autocatalytic sets. There's a brilliant experiment, but with evolved RNA molecules. What we want is the formation of collectively autocatalytic sets with libraries of random RNA or random peptides, and we're not there yet. Okay. And that hasn't worked. It works on a computer, yeah. uh, and it may or may not work in practice. If it works in practice, I'll be thrilled. So the summary of all of that is, um, and I'll say a little bit more about the ribozyme molecule in a second, I think it's perfectly plausible that life started with collectively autocatalytic sets, or molecular reproduction. That's not life yet. Let me jump ahead and tell you what Bruce talked about. So Bruce, and da Bruce Damer and David Deemer have this beautiful scenario in which there's a hot little volatile pool in Western Australia three and a half billion years ago. And uh, they, they have multilamellar liposomes. A liposome is you take lipids and put them in water and they make hollow vesicles mm -hmm. that are bilipid layers. And okay. these lipids came continuously from Outer meteoric space. material. Yes, could have come from meteoric material or could have been in situ synthesis on Earth. Yeah. Those are the two plausible sources. And, and in fact, David Daimer has shown that the Murchison meteorite, which landed in 69 in Murchison, has lipids in it and you can make liposomes out of the lipids you get from the Murchison meteorite, which has 14,000 at least different compounds in it. The early Earth was very complex chemically. Okay, so, their picture is the following. You have multi-layered liposomes called, I think, multi-lamellar liposomes. And they go through wet-dry cycles in, in this hot pool as it goes through wet-dry cycles itself. When they dry down, they, um, they kind of squeeze together to a gel phase and then they're completely dried out and they kind of break open. Then if they rehydrate, they seal up again like a sealing balloon and they make these guys that are populating the water. And particles of, of matter and proteins just happen to get in get them. Yeah. yeah. So they make use of something called the plastine reaction, okay. which was discovered in 1932 by, I happen to remember this, Boston and Warsaw. I don't know how I remember it. Yeah. Anyway, the idea of the plastine reaction is the following. If you take hamburger and you put it in a, in a, in a, a test tube with, with trypsin, which is a gut enzyme, the gut enzyme breaks the, 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 the proteins down to small peptides. If you dehydrate, dehydrate that mixture of, 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 of guys, they glue together into larger polymers. And the reason is that when you make a peptide bond gluing two amino acids together, a water molecule comes out, okay? So if you remove water from the system, you're removing a product of the reaction from the system. So you drive the reaction towards synthesis, towards to the right, okay? okay? Yeah. So, and they did this in 1932. You, add, you take water away and you get larger polypeptides. You add water again and they cleave. So you get this gamish that's cleaving and ligating and cleaving and ligating. Um, so David and Bruce want to imagine that inside these multilamellar forms. So you have these gamishes 
doing things with one another, somehow in their picture, evolving over time to be more stable, okay, which is a lovely picture. I have a critique of it. The critique is they want to select on the, the polymers in their system, but the polymers will change radically every time they gamish because they just randomize. But what they're picturing is exactly what you might need to get an autocatalytic set, okay? Namely, all of these polymers being fed from the outside somehow, um, reacting with one another, they might contain autocatalytic sets. That would give you the same set of polymers, or nearly the same set, to be selected on. So now you're on your way to a protocell. So all you need, for, if you've gotten there, you're, you're roughly there. You now need to synthesize some lipids, okay? And I'd like to synthesize the connected metabolism of small molecules, which I talked about. And you're pretty close to, you're pretty close to, to, to protocells. So something like that sounds plausible to me. So let me go back to the RNA story. There's two problems with it. How in the world do you ever get something? Well, I haven't talked about this. How do you get a connected metabolism with hundreds of kinds of molecules transforming into one another with catalyzed reactions like you've got in you? Well, nobody knows, but I think it may be the same button and thread story where all of a sudden, if you catalyze enough things, you've got this big connected set of things that are connected to one another. And I write about that in, it's a new book of mine that's now in press at Oxford. Uh, and it's a testable bunch of experiments to see if you could make a connected set of reactions that, whose transformations are catalyzed by a, a set of peptides or RNA molecules that you add from the outside. So you could get a, a metabolism. So, so in the talk that I gave yesterday, um, and I, I like this, get yourself an autocatalytic set. And now we want our connected meta catalyzed metabolism, we want it to feed the autocatalytic set by making stuff the set needs. And we want the set to be catalyzing the reactions in the connected metabolism so they can co-evolve together. So put those two things together, which is at least conceivable, then have the set that you've got so far still in the pool, make some lipids, and now you can make, auto now you can make the bounding multilayer membranes, or just have the whole thing happen in the damer demer scenario. And, you know, we might in the next 10 years get ourselves to protocells. Mind you, we always say 10 years from now or 50 years from now, and it's never worked. Yeah. Okay, so caution, right? And meanwhile, as far as I know, these guys are conscious. Yeah. I mean, I don't know that they're not conscious. We've covered the origins of life, consciousness, quantum theory. I think that's enough um, for, for 45 minutes. Just remember that who knows what, whether this is right or not. I mean, just be very, very skeptical. I mean, I'm very skeptical, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're not hopeless. Yeah, yeah. What I've said is not hopeless. Yeah. Okay, um, moving on now. Uh, how do you see humanity going forward and our role in, in nature? Wow. wow. The sustainable future. Yeah. Uh, these are huge issues, Josh. Yeah. Um, and, I, and, you know, maybe because... Maybe because we have to, I think we need to think about it. So I do, th I do think about it. I'll tell you a little story that will frame it for you. When I was 52, I went to a little meeting of four of us at something called the Gihan Foundation, okay. which was led by a guy named Michael Nesmith, who was one of the monkeys. His mother, mother invented liquid paper. And Michael uh, ran these meetings every two years in which he gathered three to five people to consider the great problems confronting mankind and I was 52. And there was this marvelous guy named N. Scott Mamaday, who was a Kiowa, six foot seven, 280 pound bass voiced poet. Bass voiced. Bass voiced. Bass voiced, okay. Meaning you don't argue with, yeah. you, don't, you okay. do not argue Kinda with like Scott. Barry White. Yeah, you do not argue with, with yeah. Scott. Okay. So we're sitting around wondering what was the big problems confronting mankind, as if four people could do anything. Mm -hmm. And Scott suddenly got up and he said, and I can't do his voice, the greatest problem confronting mankind is to reinvent the sacred. And my response was, you know, Jewish, 52-year-old fruit fly geneticist, yeah. you can't say that. And 15 seconds later, I knew he was right. I don't know why I knew he was right. I knew he was right. Um, so I wound up writing a book in 2008 called Reinventing the Sacred yeah. because, of, because of Scott uh, and credit him with the story. Is that the sacred in relation yeah. to our appreciation of and respect of nature? Yeah. Yeah. Um, That's a very shamanic yeah. philosophy. 
Yeah, it is a shamanic philosophy. Um, so we wound up writing a position paper in which we said a global civilization is emerging. This is 92. We are in its heroic stages. We need a transnational mythic structure to sustain that growth. And we need a global ethic. And we handed it to the newspapers. Josh, I still think we were right. And that's the question you're asking me. And you're asking me because you're asking yourself. Yeah, so we need a, a new myth to adhere to or we need yeah. to let go of. So Elizabeth Satoris, who you probably know. No. Um, she's a theoretical evolutionary biologist. Yeah. Um, Bruce Damon knew her. Um, and she says we need to let go of the hero's journey myth. Oh, And cooperate on a much more holistic, oh, that's um, interesting. elevated level. Yeah. Um, because the world is in crisis and we, we cannot continue operating as a species. Being heroes. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. I get, I get part ways. See, see what you think of this. I think, I think two things have a reasonable chance of happening in the next 50 years. One is we have 40 civilizations that are crowding together. Mm -hmm. My hope is we will mingle not become one civilization, keep the roots, the sacred roots of our different civilizations, but yeah. mingle our branches and co-invent together where we can do so safely because it doesn't threaten our roots. So you can have yeah. Chinese Cuban mm -hmm. cuisine because it's just fun, okay. right? What if we can co-invent, what if, what part of what's going to happen to us is that we will be so interconnected in this kind of way that we can co-invent with one another more than we ever have before. And that becomes part of our mythic structure of our task is to co-invent together. I mean, it's our joy yeah. is to yeah. co-create. We're doing it right now. Okay. okay. I mean, y yes, you're interviewing. But don't you see uh, science or maybe I should correctly say material reductionist science as being in direct contrast with that philosophy? Yes. And it seems to be like the, the um, underlying worldview which, which dominates most people's worldview. You know, everything is just material. Um, all that matters is what you can touch and feel and what you can buy. What you can buy and sell. Yeah. Yeah, we're, yeah. we're, we're trapped in late capitalism, uh -huh. right? Which is, that's part of what you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah I, I agree. Um, and I think there's things to be said about that too. Um, I may be, I, maybe I'm going to write a new book. Um, you know the two cultures, C.P. Snow's famous article, The Two Cultures, oh, written in 1975 or something like that. Okay. So C.P. Snow wrote something saying that, you know, illiterati here in England don't know a damn thing about the second law of thermodynamics because literature held sway as, as high culture and science was down. Yeah. It's reversed now, okay? And he says, why can't we unite the two cultures? Josh, I've done a body of work, not to just tell you about my work, but what the heck, we're sitting here. I think I have shown something that maybe, the, if I'm right, it may be the most important thing I've done in my life, and it may really be important. Um, I think I have shown that there, back up, Newton's laws entail the becoming of the universe. It's, Intel. yeah, here it is. Yeah, okay. You've got Newton's laws in differential form. Integrate his equation to get the trajectories. Yeah. Well, that's, the integration is to, to integrate is to deduce the consequences of the differential equations for the trajectories, right? That's entailing. Like all men are mortal. Socrates is a man, therefore Socrates is mortal. Yeah. Okay. So Newton mathematizes Aristotle's efficient cause as deduction. Okay. So he gives us an entailed universe and a deistic God, you know, in the 18th century, right? Theism is out because you can't work miracles in Newton's universe. What I think I have shown is that there is no law whatsoever that entails the becoming of the biosphere. You cannot write down equations for evolution. You can write down equations for how your heart works, okay. but yeah. not the coming into existence of hearts. Yeah. Okay, so you think um, mathematics is, is inadequate and will yep. always be inadequate to right. describe Correct. certain things like consciousness, evolution, Evolution. Um, I don't know about consciousness, but evolution. Play involved in biology. Yes. Chemistry. Chemistry, you can do mathematically. Okay. okay. But think of the evolution of uh, think of technological evolution of, of the global economic web. 
You can't write down an equation for the becoming of the, of the global economic web that's gone from 10,000 goods and services 50,000 years ago to a billion different things now. And nobody knows why or how that's happened. Do you think anybody can write down an equation for the specific becoming of the economy? No. So I think it's beyond law. Yeah. But that I mean, means... Even, this is pretty... I find this hilarious. So um, it, back on the discussion of consciousness, people say that the internet now has as many connections with all the computer systems worldwide that it's, uh, it's approaching the brain with the brain. Therefore, the internet is conscious. No. And people even say that about the stock market. No. Yeah. Not if it depends on quantum measurement. No. Uh -huh. yeah. But a couple of sentences more. If you cannot write down equations for the becoming of the biosphere, what you can do is study the history of the becoming of the biosphere, which is called paleontology, right? Which, in effect, is telling the story of what happened. Yeah. The same thing for the economy. We can tell the narrative of what happened. And what I'm becoming quite enthralled by is there's a, whole, there's a world of law, physics. Yeah. There's a world beyond law, okay, which is, which is history, which is cultural evolution, which is the evolution of art, which is the evolution of the economy, where we tell stories and where uh, there's magic in it, Josh. It's not, it's not a machine. We're yeah. in something much yeah. richer than a machine. So I can't remember who it was that said, but um, it, it, well, I think it was a physicist, early 20th century physicist that said that reality is starting to look more like a great thought than a great machine. Who said that? That's a neat, evades me. <laughs> that's a neat, neat, neat line. Yeah. But there's another thing that may be happening. See what you think. Um, like it or not, we, we're, we're denuding the planet. I mean, we've got global warming. We're screwing up the seas. What if what happens in the next 50 years includes the melding together of our culture so that we invent together, one. Two, the realization that science isn't the answer to everything. The evolution yeah. of the common yeah. law is brilliant and by god it's not physics it's a bunch of smart people saying how will we live together and what if that includes the fact that we now really have to take on the fact that we live on a global planet and we're having global impact and we better do something about it and take responsibility for it as if we knew what to do which we don't but but we're responsible well that begins to change us and maybe Maybe the impact of, of, of the globalization of our, of our problems, yeah. in this sense of like planetary warming and stuff, and our gluing together of our civilizations will drive us out of uh, an almost idiotic late capitalism, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. you're right. Yeah. Do you think science and technology will play a vital role in, in uh, the future for, for getting us out of this mess? I personally think we've progressed way too far. I think it would have been better if we stayed at a technological level, um, kind of in tune with how we were in the Renaissance period. Yes, maybe. When, when most yes. people were peasant farmers. Yes, you might be right. Yeah, we were more in harmony with nature then. Yeah. Uh, and that way of living we'd, would have been sustainable. Um, I don't disagree with you. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with you. I mean, uh, I, I don't disagree with you. We're, we're not going to go back, okay? Yeah, yeah. But the, you, you, know, you, you know the price theory of value. The value of the thing that I produce is what somebody else will pay me for it, right? As opposed to Marx's labor theory of value, which is the value of the thing is how many hours I put into making it. The price theory of value um, says that you've maximized value if you do a lot of buying and selling, which is what late capitalism is doing. Right? We're, 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 we're all full of value buying crap that we don't need. Yet we're sitting in a really beautiful place at the same time. So some of it's not so bad, and some of it's just idiotic. So we're, we're, what we need is a different, well, we, need, like we the, need different values. This hotel, for example, beautiful hotel, and they've built it around these giant uh, cacti. I can't remember what they're called now. Sigoy. Saguaro. Saguaro. Yeah. Saguaro cacti, the biggest cacti in the world. And they've built the hotel around these ancient cacti, which some are between two and three hundred years old. Right. And I think that is a good uh, method 
Um, and that's a method we should have yeah. employed with all our constructions and our yes. technological yes, wizardry of, to build it around yeah. pre-existing structures in nature rather yeah. than plow through all these forests. And yeah, rather, yeah. Rather, rather than paving it over. Yeah. Right. How many shopping malls do we need after all? Exactly. Around the world, it's the same shopping mall. I mean, you could have copied one shopping mall and just yeah. planted it. Cloned it. Cl just just cloned shopping mall. Print it with Joe a shopping mall. Printer. Right. Done, print it with done, the, done. Right. I mean, you know, in, yeah. in Azerbaijan, you have the same shopping mall. Yeah. Right. Our, our, our value system has gotten so. It's kind of grotesque. Yeah. Right. M mind you, I don't know what's going to shock us out of this. The, the, we'll both agree with this. The holding power of the contemporary way of doing things is always very strong. My wife and I are just reading a very interesting book called The, 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 the Passions of the Western Mind. Is that one of yours? No. <laughs> no, it's a book by a guy named Richard Tarnas. Uh -huh. It starts pre-Socratic and it, it ends in 1991 when he published the book. Yeah. It ends with the postmodernists. It's fascinating to look at it, Josh. You look at the way civilization, Western civilization, has changed. We're rushing pell-mell down something that's pointless, which is what you're saying, right? Yeah. Driven, by, driven by late capitalism. And we haven't figured out what better to do. And the only way you can, you, we, we can't do hunting and gathering anymore, yeah. Yeah. right? There's too many of us. So we've got to sell and buy. But why are we selling the crap that we're selling? Yeah. Yeah, the problem is the, the business model that has driven the most successful uh, blue chip companies. They're so geared towards making profit. I mean, if you look at Big Pharma, yeah. they're not finding new drugs. They're not going into the Amazon. Dennis McKenna said that with it's estimated about 70% of psychoactive drugs for, for mental health, etc., are derived from plants, and yet we've only tapped into 3% of the possible plant medicines in the Amazon alone. Yeah. Instead, these pharmaceutical companies are literally modifying a sure, side chain right. and rebranding it and making billions because it's a yeah. There's um, a reason for proven it. Proven business model. Sure, yeah. and you've just said why. It costs a couple. It costs a couple hundred million dollars to make a new drug. Yeah. There's a lot of dry holes. Why not milk something that you've got by modifying it a little bit and putting it back out on the market? Uh -huh. So that's that's not stupid, and it might it works sometimes too. So it's not totally evil. Okay. But you're right. I mean, it's not a... taking a risk, is it? No. There's no taking... risk and all the reward. Well, that's not true. I mean, uh, there's still risk. There's still a lot of dry holes in the drug industry. Um, and I get angry at them too. But, yeah, but, but not, not a risk in the same way as like investing millions or on an expedition into the middle of the Amazon to find yeah. potential botanical medicines. I, I, th I think they do a fair amount of that too, Josh. I don't, look, I don't really know, okay? And I know that it's easy to be angry at the pharmaceutical okay, companies. I'm just going but, by what Dennis McKenna. And that may be true, I don't, I don't know. The bigger problem is, the bigger problem is, um, we really are stuck with late capitalism. We really are stuck with a, a power law distribution of wealth in which it's getting flatter and flatter and flatter. You know this, in which yeah, yeah. a I smaller and smaller fraction of the people own more and yeah, more and more yeah, of the I wealth. Think something like in, in America alone, in the U.S., um, 40, the top richest 40 or 45 people own as much wealth as the poorer 50 percent right. of the population. Yeah, you, do you know about power laws? Uh, not to me. Let me just check time. I'm okay. Um, so here it is. This has been known for a long time. This isn't new. Pareto did this. I guess it's pronounced Pareto. Plot on one axis, plot log your income. Yeah. On the other axis, plot log how many people with that income. So it's a log log plot. Can okay, you remember one? You remember log? You remember yeah, logarithms? Yeah, yeah. Okay, like one ten, a hundred, a thousand is log one, two, three, four. Yeah. If you get it, what you get is a straight line down to the right. A straight line in a log log plot means that one thing is the other thing raised to a power. Yeah. This is to a negative power. Mm -hmm. So the slope is a, a straight line to the right, so it's a power law. But something astonishing about power laws is, you know the, a Gaussian distribution, you know, just, yeah. you know. A Gaussian distribution has a mean and a variance. I learned to my astonishment about 10 years ago, a flat enough power law doesn't even have an average. It doesn't have a mean, it doesn't have a variance. It's just all those rich people out there with all the fucking money, right? And they are. And what's happened is that the power law, it was a power law years ago, it's getting flatter, which means there's 
fewer and fewer people with more and more and more of the wealth. Okay, so uh, I, mean, I have some idea. Do you have? I have two ideas about what to do about it. They'll never get in. But corporations are limited liability creatures, right? Yeah. And they're legal persons in the United States. Well, those are legal fictions. Let's take away companies being legal persons so they can't have PACs in the United States. That's just grotesque. And what if one very, very carefully tuned away some of the ways in which corporations are, have limited liability? You don't want to do it too much because you'd stop too much active economic activity and we'd go into a depression. But there might be a smart way of doing it such that corporate officers would be scared to do certain things because they'd go to jail rather than having it limited liability and corporate corporate you know officers insurance would be extraordinarily high yeah. this will never happen josh i mean the, the 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 power structures would tell me i'm being a stupid naive uh, old man and i am being a stupid naive old man but if we could begin to think of some ways to to tune the system that'd be good and we need something fundamental i mean your image of your image of living like we did in the renaissance where people did perfectly well thank you Okay, why not? And they had Michelangelo, you know, and we don't. Right, that says something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, and what can you comment on the, the current state of, of like the rampant mental health issues and dependence on, on drugs at the moment that we see? Particularly in the United States. Yeah, and especially in the urban environments where, uh, yeah. in London, I think uh, about 30, more than 30% of adults are um, clinically depressed. I have no expertise, but can I just sort of comment as another citizen of, yeah. of wherever we are? Um, first of all, the opioid epidemic in the United States appears to be substantially due to the fact that doctors just prescribed it too liberally. But then they got addicted and now they're stuck. So that's a mistake that has to be fixed and not allowed to happen again. But, but look at crack cocaine and you know, the, the other drugs. Um, and what do we do about that? Th this, is your, this is the drug part of, of the problem. I, I guess I think about that in some very cautious way. We really ought to legalize drugs and treat it as a disease rather than the black markets that are rampant now. I mean, look, look at the look what's happening in Mexico. The government should control them and like tax them like they do yeah. alcohol. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Holland does it. Yeah. So why aren't we doing what Holland did? Uh, we could study Holland. Maybe some other countries have legalized drugs. I, mean, I think that heroin is really dangerous. It's, marijuana isn't, but but heroin really is. You don't want people running around getting addicted to heroin. So you can't legalize everything as if it was just kind of cute. But but at least you could eliminate the black market and the crime. And that, that's already big because the, the, the people who are selling the drugs, making money on it, are pushing the drugs. Well, so they're making the problem worse. If you could get rid of that part of it, that might help. It's only a piece, but, but that's within our control. Yeah. And I, I, can't, I can't speak to the emotional problems of Londoners. Except, but gosh, you've, you've, you, you've cleaned up the soot that was around the place when I was at Oxford. It's yeah. pretty bright in London now. I feel like... Um, we should draw on ideas from um, shamanism, um, Eastern wisdom traditions, etc. These ancient philosophical wisdom traditions where um, often like discipline, extreme discipline was involved because people just want to take the shortcut and take the pill and they lapse into these addictive behavioral patterns. Yeah. Um, but there, there is not the discipline which I feel is required to make the transformation to overcome um, such addictions and, and less conscious behavioral patterns. So gosh, I have nothing. I'm certainly hearing you, Josh. Um, I, I don't know what causes severe depression. I don't know what causes all of these things. Um, Think but it has a molecular base, a neuro. Some of it clearly, yeah. some of it clearly does. Sure, um, some of it clearly does. Early childhood experiences clearly have something to do with it. But probably thirty percent of the British population didn't have miserable childhoods, or maybe they did. I don't know. Um, so I don't know. But uh, my son is very interested in an alternative medicine, and I trained as a doc, um, where we're not taught alternative medicine. 
So I, I do clearly think we need to explore alternative medicine and shamanistic traditions and so on. There's two forms of resistance to that. One is arrogance. Look, I'm a, I'm a Western doc. I haven't practiced in a long time, but I am. Western medicine is really good. Okay, and if you get sick and you really want good treatment, go to a good hospital and you'll get good treatment, by and large. Uh, thing one. Thing two, that arrogance stands in the way of looking at things that come from outside Western medicine's tradition. We're better than you, okay? But after all, Ayurvedic medicine and Chinese medicine have been doing things for 4,000 years. They must be doing something. But thing three, insurance now covers acupuncture in this country, so we can absorb some things. But there's something else, Josh, which is honorable and needs to be treated tenderly. I know this, again, because I trained as a doc. We are taught best practice. My patient has XYZ disease. Here is the best treatment for XYZ disease. I am trained to give that treatment, and by gumbo, I will give that treatment, or I am legally liable, I am ethically liable, okay? I'm a bad person if I do not do best treatment. So when you come along and you say, shaman, I say, but I've got penicillin works better, okay? No, it's not best treatment, I will not look, okay? And that part is to some substantial extent honorable, and because penicillin does work better than, than for example, beating a drum for somebody who's got a bacterial infection. So we need some way of saying that it is permissible to explore and this isn't a new idea. NIH has uh, basically an institute for alternative medicine and has for, for maybe 20 or 30 years that is trying to do that. I don't know how efficiently, but that's a good thing. That it's silly not to do that. But you don't want to ram shamanism down somebody's throat who's just, you know, gotten, needs spinal surgery, right? But you do want to ram shamanism down their throat, if, for example, it'll treat their depression. Right, which is part of what we're saying. So somehow this needs some kind of balance and goodwill. So we'll go back to the we'll go back to the in, enlightenment. Yeah, yeah that's a really so neat idea. Sure. Yeah. Final topic. Um, Let me just check time. Oh, I've got another got five about minutes. Five minutes left. Yeah. So. As I said, I mentioned to Deepak Chopra before I asked him a question that uh, a lot of people um, like that I've met here seem to base uh, their reality tunnel and some of their theories on really profound experiences that they've had in their life. I'm, I also fall into that category. Um, and I met a friend of yours, uh, Jeremy Sherman. Sherman, and he really put it into the most beautiful context and explain that we follow what we like uh, uh, like the pleasure principle um, but there is what the like and the likely so often what is more likely is we don't romanticize and, and it doesn't imbue us <laughs> with, with passion and pleasure um, but we follow like the fiction and that's how important do you think that is as human beings? Well, we've to follow the fiction. Beings, yeah. To follow yeah. the fiction. Yeah. I, I don't know what you're asking yet. I mean, we, we know we know like. I, I know. I understand like. I understand yeah. likely. And the fiction yeah. is what, Josh? Um, I guess we need we need fiction as emotional beings. Um, otherwise, we might just be. Uh, adhere too strongly to just a material okay. world view where everything, where, where just meat robots, as Dawkins says, and what's the point in anything? Because we're just going to die. Yeah, so we need the, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so there's several ways of saying, uh -huh. different ways of saying, I think, what you're pointing at. Uh, William Gaddis, and I think it's the recollections or the recognitions or something, said there's no truth beyond magic. Yeah. Um, and my book, Reinventing the Sacred, uh, building on Scott Mamaday, is about the fact that there's no law entailing the becoming of the biosphere, which is enchanting. To me, it's enchanting. There's no law that, that governs these things coming into existence, including the roadrunner, okay, which is an enchanting little big bird. Um, so 
we need story, we need narrative, we need Shakespeare, uh, we need good theater, we need, you know, Aristotle wrote about drama and it, it's and how it works in us. We need it. We need, we, 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 we our souls need it a lot. Um, and that's part of what this new book that I want to write about, if I ever write it, I don't know that I will. There's a world of story. There's a world of, there's a world beyond law that includes story. Okay. For example, the evolution of the common law is romantic as hell. It's grungy, but it's romantic as hell about the strange ways that things have come to be in the law that, you know, one, one knows about. So uh, those are your fictions. There's no set way that the common law becomes, right? It's the grungy, magical grappling with how people make our ways in the world with one another. That's at least part of it. I, mean, don't, I, mean, I think we need magic. Yeah. I, I, I think the, the, the shopping malls have denuded us. Yeah. Have you heard the phrase by your past Prime Minister, Gordon Brown? He said, we're reduced to price tags. Isn't that an amazing thing for a Prime Minister right. of the UK to yeah. say? Well, he's right. Yeah. Now what are we going to do, Josh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who has the answers, huh? I'm actually going to Kumbh Mela Festival next year in India where all the sadhus come out of hiding once every three years to, to bathe in the Ganges. And um, I'm hoping they, they might shed some valuable insights on, on the, the problem we're facing as a species. Yeah. Well, and, but, and so, so, universe. so part of what's happening is that you're going to go see these people who I've never heard of before, but you will, you will film them and you will broadcast them, and it will reach thousands to hundreds of thousands of people who may say something like, oh, wow, look at that, which is what you're hoping, right? Perhaps. Yeah, it's part of what you're hoping. Perhaps I'll just discuss the, the, the problems we're faced with primarily in the West um, and get their take on it. Yeah, but then you would like people to see it too and begin to think about it. Yeah. But that's part of the co-creativity that we begin to be able to do now, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you're just connecting us, right? Yeah. You're a piece of the becoming of, uh, of us weaving together. Mm -hmm. One thing that Bruce pointed out walking around here is that um, people are so rarely present. They're so trapped in thoughts. And um, I mean, these yogis and sadhus in India, they practice mindfulness and meditation 24-7. Um, so that's the, the contrast. It's con contrapuntal, yeah. contrapuntal to late capitalism. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? yeah. yeah. I better okay. go. Thank you so J much. Josh, I hope you found this more or less what you wanted.